Rush was and still is one of the most underrated and yet talented groups of all time, but their drummer Neil Peart was truly a force of nature. From his impressive drum kit to his hard hitting and versatile drumming on tracks like Working Man, Tom Sawyer, and The Spirit of the Radio, Neil was one of the greats. In this video, several contemporaries and followers of Neil and Rush have come together to honor his incredible legacy. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more great content as it really helps us out. Anyways, let's get into it. It. Number nine, Vinnie Paul. <laughs> Number eight, Lars Ulrich. The first time I ever uh, met Neil, it was 1984. Our manager Cliff signed Rush, and I had drum questions about gear, then this and that. And he goes, Neil loves to talk to younger drummers. He goes, call Neil, he wants to hear from you. And it was like, huh? <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> 20 years old. With not a pot to piss in and we spoke 30 45 minutes on the phone and we're geeking out on drums and the whole thing was like a fairy tale you can't play drums and not love neil number seven danny carey um i'd like to thank as artists you know we're all influenced by uh the people that come before us and um for me it's all the the great drum gods, I suppose, that come before, and I do my best to channel them every time I'm working. Um, namely, uh, John Bonham, Tony Williams, and uh, recently, my good friend, Neil Peart. Yeah. Um, this is for all of you guys. Number six, Chad Smith. Happy birthday, Neil. Um, you know, when I was about 14 years old, I was a sophomore in high school, and I really loved playing drums, and I had played music and drums since I was seven, and sports and other things. But by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I spent, if not all, I would say 80% of my sophomore year in Andover High School, in, outside of Detroit, Michigan, in the parking lot, listening to 2112. And that was pretty much my sophomore year. It was life-changing for me because up until that point, I, was, I had an older brother who listened to a lot of the English rock albums and, and Led Zeppelin was, was, was probably my favorite and John Bonham's drumming was so influential to me along with a lot of others, but he was probably my favorite. And so if you think of how John Bonham plays and how Neil plays, they're very two different, very distinct, unique amazing drum styles but very different so i was you know bonham trying to do all the triplets and make it feel like him and then lo and behold i get turned on to rush in 1976 or 77 and it's just like changed my life and neil's drumming was was so um it, it, just like the parts that he came up with and 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 his his the way his style and it was so perfectly it just fit the music so well and it was so musical and so just like amazing technically obviously but just it was seemed so like though nothing else those were the drum parts that were supposed to be in those songs and i learned them all and i would go down in my basement after i wouldn't go to school and i would put the headphones on and i'd, I'd listen to 2112 and play along with it and I pretended, you know, like I was in the band and I had, I changed my whole drum set up. I had, I got three roto toms and then a two, three racks, the splash, the cowbells, like a real poor man's version of Neil's kid at that time. And literally, it really, it really changed my life. I could kind of hack my way through like his, his fills and his feels and everything. But, um, I think that any drummer really worth his salt, any rock drummer, needs to have a Neil phase. You need to go through and and immerse yourself in the drumming and the music of Rush and, and the drumming of Neil, in which there is so much, and we're so lucky to still have that today. Um, you know, I didn't... I, I went to a Rush concert in 1980, and it was the first concert at Joe Louis Arena, I remember that because um, I was came out afterwards and in the parking lot our car wouldn't start and it was in December and we were stuck in the snow 
and nobody to jump our car. So I, I do remember that very well. But again, like um, just to see him perform and, and the way that he performed those songs, it was almost as if he was approaching it like a classical musician. Like those parts were so well thought out and so well executed. And he was, and I've never seen more air drumming in, in an arena than you would at a Rush concert. And it was just incredible. And I'm like seeing my hero for the first time. And, and it just, it was, it was, again, another life changing thing that they were even better live. It was incredible. And he had so much energy, so much power, um, finesse. His drum set looked so fucking cool. I mean, everything about it was just like next level. I just floated on home. Uh, so fast forward, you know, I joined my little band years later in, in the early, early, late, 80s with the Chili Peppers and we're playing and doing our thing and sloshing around and uh, you know somehow I befriended Alex Lifeson the guitar player and we became friends and um, one of the funniest people that I know and an amazing obviously amazing musician and I tried to cool it with my fandom I didn't want to be you know tell him what a rush nerd I am and was and um, he was, he's always been so gracious and so nice. And he said, you got to come to one of our concerts and you, you know, be our guest. And so this is, this is, um, probably in the early, early nineties. And, um, I said, is it possible that I, I could, you know, meet Neil? He said, sure. I'll tell him. Yeah, of course. I, yeah, well, I'll introduce you to him. So I go, I'm all nervous. And, and, um, I think it was at the universal amphitheater and he, he, uh, so I go and get my tickets and there's passes and you know all the laminates and all that stuff and and I walk in and somebody finds me from their from their their group, um, you know like a like a road manager person said oh Neil wants to see you I'm like <laughs> okay <laughs> I'm like and he's in his little dressing room inside and 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 I I think I was with Chris Stanky from Sabian he was a good friend of his and I go in and. I'm nervous, you know, and sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes kind of thing, but I open the door. Hey, Chad, I didn't even knew that he knew I existed on the planet. He's like, man, thank you so much for coming. Alex told me about you guys. Da, da, da. And he's like, I, I love your music and I, your drumming is really great. And like, sometimes people say that and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then he starts on the song and this groove and what were you doing thinking what kind of drums and like, he really like, he was legit. And I was like, oh my God. I'm like, I couldn't even be like, oh, but you have no idea, you know, I want to freak him out. But he was so kind and generous and thoughtful and like just humble and I, I really, I always took that away as like, here's someone who's, at the, who's like in the top three rock drummers of all time. And he's, you know, taking the time to like talk to this kid at the time-ish and like just really, really like cool and, and nice. And he had this real dry sense of humor. And, um, but he was really funny. I think a lot of people think, and I thought, like, when he's drumming, he's so serious. He never cracks a smile, you know? And I'm thinking, man, this guy's like, this, this dude's serious, serious, serious cat. And when he's playing, he's all business. But he's funny and, like, um, it was, he was just really warm. And it was great. And I was talking to him. And I think I may have ma mentioned the fact that, like, I was really, because what drummers do you like? And we talked about Stuart Copeland. I love him. And, and then I, I told him I was really into John Bonham. And then... When I was in high school, I really, I really got into Rush and your drumming. And I said, it's so different. And he goes, yeah, Bonham had that swing. And I go, yeah. And he goes, I have the Canadian swing. <laughs> and like really, you know, was poking fun at himself or whatever. So that was the beginning. That's when I met him. And then, you know, years would go by and I would see him whenever they would come in concert. And then one time they did a Buddy Rich thing and it was in new york city and we were rehearsing here i'm at the drum channel in oxnard and terry bozio was on it and neil was on it some other really great players and and musicians were here and we were rehearsing with the band and it was a big band and orchestra and the whole thing and 
It wasn't Buddy's band, but it was a band from here. Anyway, we're rehearsing, and I never played in front of Neil. So I was like, I'm sitting, and I'm out of my element playing like these Buddy Rich charts and songs and like big bands, not my thing. And I, I'm, I'm kind of just winging it, just holding on for dear life, hoping it's going to be okay. And so there's there's Terry and Neil and Don and some other people are are sitting behind me and I'm playing this weather report song and just going for it. Like just <laughs> really going for it as hard as I can, trying, knowing like I'm not looking over here and I'm playing all my stuff. Songs over. Terry, who's always so so supportive. Johnny, you, that sounded amazing. You sound like Tony Williams, this and that. And the other thing, I'm like, oh, thank you, Terry, so much, so sweet. And Neil comes over to me and he kind of looks around the drums and he looks at me and he goes, Do you think you think you could play a little bit harder? <laughs> which is so Neil, because I was bashing my brains out, which I normally do, but this was extra. So, like, and he looked at me and kind of winked and laughed. And it was so fun and he was so cool and we had such a good time. Um, and then, you know, I would fast forward to the last concert that Rush played, that Rush ever played, was at the Forum in Los Angeles. And I was there at the last night, and there were Taylor Hawkins and Danny Carey and Stuart Copeland. We're all sitting in a row, and we're all air drumming, and it's a great, amazing show. Little did we know that was the last time that they would ever play. Um, you know, and those same four guys were honored to be at his memorial as well. And uh, Stuart got up and said a few things. And, and he said, uh, at one point, he said, you know, I can't tell you on count of my hand how many people have come up to me and said, hey, you're my second favorite drummer. And we all laughed and we all nodded because Neil is Neil. And there's only one and there'll never be another one. He's amazing. I love him. I love his family. Uh, they're, they're just incredible people. And what a legacy. Um, yeah. God bless Neil Pert. Number five, Tommy Lee. I mean, rest in peace, Neil. Um, I mean, dude, what drummer or fuck, not even a drummer. You just what, air drummer, um, you know, playing Tom Sawyer, uh, you know, like, dude, I mean, the guy was fucking badass, you know. Um, there's no, no doubt about that. Um, I wish I would have had a chance to meet him. That's, it's odd. I feel like I've met just about everybody, but I never got a chance to meet him. Um, uh, but, but, you know, uh, definitely influenced by him, um, and several other drummers. Number four, Kenny Aronoff. Well, Neil, I, I met him when I was doing the uh, recording with the Buddy Rich Big Band for a tribute to Buddy in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, I was the last guy last day because I was so busy recording all over the place. I was in Nashville. That was the week I was doing uh, Philadelphia with, with the Cinderella. I was in Nashville with Hank Jr. I think I was in Memphis and I was in Canada. And I barely, I didn't, I was scared I wasn't going to make it to the session. I was the last guy last day. Walking Neil is very, very nice, very kind. And, um, and then we didn't get to hang too much. But what happened was I was recording later that year in Montreal, in a very famous, outside of Montreal, very famous studio, which sadly is now gone, called Morin Heights where Rush would do records up there. I did a lot of records with different artists up there, mostly Canadian. And, uh, you know, Bon Jovi produced Aldo Nova, which was a big uh, uh, Canadian artist. So we did it there. I did uh, Corey Hart, who grew up in Montreal, up there. Um, anyway, I'm up there doing something with Corey Hart. He's producing an artist, a female artist. And all of a sudden, Neil Pert pops his head in. He says, "Oh, Kenny, can I talk to you?" And he says, "Listen, I'm, 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 I was, I'm mixing the Buddy Rich tracks, but uh, there's this one song called Pick Up the Pieces' by Average White Band, and and um, uh, what's his name didn't want to take a uh, a drum solo uh, on it, and um, I'm spacing out for some reason. Um, Steve Ferroni didn't want to take a drum solo. He's just like the groove. I feel like it needs something. So you want to overdub percussion." 
Well, I've had a lot of experience playing percussion because in Mellencamp band, I had to do a lot of percussion. A lot of weird building tracks up from the big bottom up, sometimes doing percussion first, then drums. So Neil and I started with the low tones and then moved up to the middle tones, then the medium tones, then the medium high tones, then the high tones. And we spent a long time jamming together, playing. We called ourselves the Bald, bald Bongo Brothers or something. It's kind of... I don't know. I don't know. It was something crazy. And afterwards, I got into one of his sports cars, drove to his house, and uh, we drank some scotch and uh, listened to the uh, mixes of the Buddy Rich Big Band, hung out, and he showed me where he, it was an island. Uh, I could, we were up on a hill in the woods. It was beautiful. It was an island down there. And he said he'd go over there. Um, by himself or with his daughter or something. His, mom, his wife was in the house. They would do like Morse code or signals back to each other. You know, so we became real close uh, ever since then. And when sometimes I'd be in his bus driver, or Rush's bus driver became uh, Melissa Etheridge's bus driver. And we were on tour uh, one time in Toronto and I had dinner with uh, all the guys in Rush. <laughs> Amazing. You know, it was really cool. And, you know, of course, Neil is like, Extraordinary, extraordinary drummer and incredible writer too. Number three, Mike Portnoy. I can't possibly st overstate how much Rush had an influence on me as a, as a young teenager. I would say from the time, from like around 1981 to about 1987, they were my gods. You know, Neil Peart was, was my god at that point and was a huge, huge, um, uh, influence on my drumming, um, you know, the, the, the size of the drum set, the way I approach the drums, the odd time signatures, the progressive style of instrumental music. I mean, just everything about Rush at that point when I was a developing teenager was, was huge. And uh, I've seen them on every tour since then. Uh, I haven't missed a tour and, uh, you know, all through these years, 30 years later, I'm still, you know, just as much of a fan and supporter as, as I ever was. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, it, it's amazing that they're now celebrating 40 years. It's, it's incredible. It's amazing how time flies. I remember seeing them for the first time on the Signals tour in 82, I think. And that's like, you know, 30 something years ago at this point. It's crazy. Number two, Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins. And of course, fucking Neil Perkins. God, come on. This guy spawned a generation of air drummers for decades to come. With his composition, craft, and technique, his drumming was songwriting. It was just as musical, just as melodic as any other instrument in the band, bringing the drums where they fucking should be to the forefront of every song. But here's the thing about Neil Peart. Not only was he the most fucking ripping drummer in the world, he wrote the fucking lyrics. Who let the fucking drummer write the lyrics? Rush did, baby. Makes no sense. Playing upwards of 250 shows a year, from day one, the band built its following the right way. No hype, no bullshit. They did it from the ground up. Without any help from the mainstream press. <laughs> Rolling stone. <laughs> Rush, Fly by Night, Caress and Steel, 2112, A Farewell to King, Hemisphere, Permanent Wave, Moving Pictures, Signals, Great Under Pressure, Power Windows, Hold Your Fire, Presto, Roll the Bones, Counterpart, Casper Echo, Vapor Trail, Feedback, Snakes and Arrows, Clockwork Angels, 45 years, over 40 million records, thousands of shows, selling out arenas all over the world. Their influence is undeniable, and their devoted fan base only rivaled by the Grateful Dead. Look at you people right there, all of you right there. And their legacy is that of a band that stayed true to themselves no matter how uncool they may have seemed to anyone. I think it's safe to say 
that Rush are indeed a band that has balls. Alex showed us that. Yeah. And they've always been cool. So consider this mystery solved. It is our honor to finally <laughs> induct Rush into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Number one, Stuart Copeland. It's been open season on drummers. You know, it seems like a very short period that Ginger Baker, Neil Peart, Charlie Watts, and now Taylor. Mm. And it's just not right. It, you know, Neil Peart and Ginger Baker, one of the last recordings he did was right there. He came over yeah. one afternoon and he was kind of ailing. He was here with his daughter. He played for one minute, which is, by the way, is on YouTube, The Sacred Grove. Wow. And then he sort of finished, and 20 minutes later, the paramedics arrived uh, wow. and wanted to take him to hospital. He, oh, you can, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, I'm not going to know, fucking old spit, oh, he said <laughs> in its kindly tones. Uh, <laughs> but Neil, he knew it was coming. In fact, it took about two years longer than expected. At one point, he says, dude, I am past my sell-by date by a year. And then he, he carried on for another year. But so he saw it coming. He made his piece. He was all adjusted and everybody, you know, his close friends were with him. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was it was really a first class ticket. He saw his train coming. Did they know, you know, did they know they touched everybody's life this way? I think the least the one with the least idea of how important he was would be Taylor. I mean, Neil knew that he was a professor and right. that, you know, all he had to do was play a show and there's 80,000 people air drumming every lick. Uh, and same with Charlie and same with um, Ginger Baker. Right. And there's another thing that I, I remember with Neil. When he first passed, I got a call from his roadie that afternoon. And that night, uh, they all, the band, uh, family, crew, gathered at a restaurant um, in Venice Beach. And... Right. I was, I had seen it coming. I felt that it was a full ride, a full life, well lived. And I was full of, you know, I, 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 I was, I was kind of upbeat about it, mm. but I get there and the people who are with, cause I just hang out with them occasionally, but the people who are, who he's in their lives every day, yeah. uh, his wife, his, his crew, the, you know, Alex and Getty, they were just, you know, blown away, even though they also saw it coming, but this, this this hole in their life suddenly okay cut to two weeks later the memorial service by now it's sunk in the professor is gone mm -hmm. you know uh, the no more hang at the bubba cave you know yeah and it really started to get to me and at the memorial his family and closer people had kind of begun to de deal with it and were able to smile again at the memory of his life um and there was uh in fact there was um you know Dwayne, uh, Jeff, Jeff, Jethro Tull's drummer, and, and, mm. and uh, Taylor, Chad Smith, um, Danny, Danny, um, Danny Carey. Right. Yeah. I'm a crap name dropper because I can never remember any of my best friend's <laughs> names. I would be, I would be absolutely terrible. I can just remember that guy who played in. Uh, right. we'll, we'll, we'll blame it on the curse of this show. Lamenting, you know. Yeah. We all kind of were feeling it by that time whereas getty and alex were kind of comforting us by that time and there it is did you enjoy the video was there anything said that surprised you or maybe you didn't know have you ever seen neil peart or rush live or any of the other drummers in the video what's your favorite neil peart solo or song let us know in the comments down below and if you enjoyed the video please leave a like share and subscribe as it really helps the channel out significantly and until next time i'll see you guys in the next video rock on